Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the NASA Earth Data Webinar, Explore NASA Socioeconomic Data Using Web Mapping Services. This is your host, Jennifer Brennan. I do have 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, but we'll give it just a couple more minutes as people are logging in, and then we will go ahead and, and get started here. Also, if you're listening to audio through your computer and you can hear me, would you type a little note into the Q&A pod in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen? It works like a chat. Thank you. Okay, welcome everybody. I've got just a couple minutes after 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, so why don't we get started. Thank you for joining us. You, if you've just joined, you are in the NASA Earth Data Webinar, Explore NASA Socioeconomic Data Using Web Mapping Services. I'm your host, Jennifer Brennan. I am the User Support and Communications Lead for the NASA Earth Science Data and Information System Project here at Goddard Space Flight Center. I'd like to begin by going over a few housekeeping items related to the webinar. First, audio is being broadcast both through the computer as well as via telecom. If you're listening in by telephone, please be sure to mute or turn off your computer speakers. For built-in speakers, the speaker icon is at the bottom right-hand corner of your desktop in the menu bar for PCs. You should left-click, you should be able to mute those. For Macs, you can find this in your settings. Uh, the conference has been placed in silent mode. This is done to maximize the best possible audio experience, so the speakers will not be able to hear you speaking. If you have any questions for me, um, please type them into the Q&A pod, which is right here in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. It works like a chat. You would type in any questions, uh, anything, you know, any concerns, and then hit the button directly adjacent to that, okay? Um, any issues or questions, feel free to enter them there. This webinar will be recorded. A link to the recording will be sent out to registrants within a few days of completion. The recordings will also be posted to our Earth Data Adobe Connect catalog, and I do plan to provide that URL to you at the end. In addition, all presentation files will be available for download at the end of the webinar. The webinar itself is an hour long, 45 minutes are allocated to the presentation and live demonstration, and then we have 15 minutes for the question and answer period. So after the speakers have finished their presentations, what we'll do is we'll then move to the final set of polling questions. So please be sure to stay on the line and or stay in the meeting room to participate in the question and answer period, which directly follows the poll. Depending on the volume of questions we receive today, we do plan to extend the question and answer period an additional 15 minutes to 3.15 for those of you who wish to stay on the line. As I mentioned a bit earlier, you will have an opportunity to ask your questions throughout by using the Q&A pod. It will persist throughout the presentation. We will plan to answer all questions verbally at the end of this webinar. Due to the number of participants, questions will not be answered using the raising hand function. It has been disabled. So I'd like to now move along to the agenda. The first five minutes or so will provide you with an overview for the NASA Socioeconomic Data and Application Center. We'll then follow that with 20 minutes or so of, uh, that will provide an overview of the CDAC data holdings 
and will also feature several examples of integrating remotely sensed data with socioeconomic data. We will then transition to a series of three live demonstrations or three of CDAC's web mapping tools. Our speakers today are Alex DeSherbinen, who is the Deputy Manager at CDAC, followed by Shri Vinay, the Systems Engineer at CDAC. It is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Alex DeSherbinen. Alex? Thank you very much, Jennifer, and it's a real delight to be with everybody today. Um, so this is our first try at this sort of thing, but uh, it's um, very exciting to be able to present CDAC and some of our data and services. Uh, I'll be presenting the first part, as you mentioned. I'm a geographer by training and serve as CDAC's deputy manager, and then I'll be followed by Sri Vinay who is our systems engineer and also a software engineer by training. Uh, I wanted to mention that CDAC is managed by the Center for International Earth Science Information Network. It's part of the Earth Institute at Columbia University. We're on the Lamont campus, which is about 12 miles north of Manhattan Island. So let's begin by trying to answer the question, what does CDAC do or what is our purpose? Our primary focus is on the human dimensions of environmental change. And we focus on the integration of social and earth science data, especially with remote sensing data. And uh, essentially the way I like to describe it is that we provide the contextual data and information that are needed in order to better interpret the uh, view from space that is provided by NASA satellite remote sensing instruments. We have very strong links to the geospatial community as well. So let's talk a bit about some of our data products and I'm going to interweave that with examples of data integration from the literature. So what do we mean exactly by data integration? What we mean is essentially analyzing biophysical and socioeconomic data in a common spatial framework. This entails two things. One is the translation of socioeconomic data to formats easy to use with natural science data, and all the, also the aggregation of biophysical and environmental measures to sociopolitical units. So these are two different ways of integrating data. In terms of data needs for data integration, it's important to realize that different scientific disciplines use different types of data and units of analysis. So population data is frequently stored in tabular formats that need to be linked to boundaries that are in a vector format. Physiogeographic variables, on the other hand, such as climate, vegetation, and soils, are frequently stored in roster format. And some data, both socioeconomic and biophysical, are collected as points. So linking such data requires conversion to a common spatial framework, and those could be grids, polygons, or points. The importance of data integration was pointed out in a recent National Research Council report called Tools and Methods for Estimating Populations at Risk. In that report, it says that assessments of at-risk populations involve a linkage between population data by location, types of hazards, and locations of hazards, in the societal and environmental subsystems of those locations. So essentially, it's like the old real estate adage, location, location, location. Understanding how these things interact in space is very important. Before jumping into a discussion of data sets, I wanted to quickly describe which data sets get the most citations. In 2012, uh, our analysis of the literature and, and our regular collection of citations showed that there were roughly 200 citations in peer-reviewed journals and books. Of those, about 44% were for our graded population of the world data product, which is the big blue slice of the pie on the right. This, another 25% were for the Global Rural Urban Mapping Project. About 8% of citations were for the Environmental Sustainability Index, 3% for the Human Footprint, 
2% for poverty mapping, et cetera. I'll be describing some of these data sets in a bit more detail later on. But what this does give you a clear picture of is that our population grids have been one of the most widely used data products. So speaking of population grids, this is an image on a map from our map gallery of the gridded population of the world version 3. This product was produced uh, in 2004 and re represents the 2000 round census data using roughly 400,000 census input units globally. We used proportional allocation algorithm to move people from uh, census units to grid cells. The grid cells are 2.5 arc minutes in dimension, which basically equates to four um, kilometers at the equator on the side. Among the many uses of uh, GPW data include a number of health risk analyses. This is a study that was published in Nature Climate Change in 2012. And it looks at a combination of GPW data in conjunction with aerosol optical depth data from MISER, which is the multi-angle imaging spectroradiometer, and moderate resolution data from the BOTUS, which is the moderate, uh, sorry, moderate resolution uh, imaging spectroradiometer. And it also combines a general circulation model. And the paper basically looked at the health impacts of fire emissions in Indonesia. There have been many other examples of health studies, such as malaria assessment, uh, spinal meningitis, that have used GPW. Uh, in addition, uh, this is another example from 2013, looking at CPW version 3 used in conjunction with MODIS vegetation continuous fields data and MODIS thermal anomaly products. And it was used to produce a map of global fire vulnerability. CPW was used for this map in particular to understand, better understand the value of real estate holdings in the wildland urban interface. So turning to GRUMP, which is the Global Rural Urban Mapping Project, this is actually several products in one. The first product is a global database of 70,000 settlement points. So it's probably the largest settlement points data set in existence with lat long coordinates. It maps all settlements over 5,000 persons in size. We use the settlements point data in turn to develop this global mask of urban extents. Zooming in a bit to Europe, what you will see is that we combined nighttime lights data for 2000 or circa 2000, along with points that were buffered according to population size in those regions and in those places where the luminosity or nighttime lights was not sufficient to be able to identify settlements. This, in turn, was used as an input to a new population density grid, which is at a higher resolution than GPW. The Grump population grid is at a one kilometer resolution. And what it does is it essentially sucks populations out of large administrative units into urban areas using a fairly transparent algorithm. This contrasts with LandScan. When we get lots of questions about LandScan, I'll be happy to answer some of those questions at the end if there are questions. Uh, in the sense that we use a completely transparent algorithm for, for developing this data set. Now, the Grump data have been used very extensively, as I mentioned earlier, but this is one example from a 2013 article by Karen Cito in the Proceedings of National Academies of Sciences, in which they use a modus definition of urban footprint, but then use the Grump population data layer to map what the probability is of a pixel becoming urban by the year 2030. On the left-hand side, you see that for China, large areas are anticipated to become urban by the year 2030 at a very high likelihood. For Mexico, by contrast, very small areas are likely, but very highly likely to become urban in 2030, by 2030 
And for Turkey, on the other hand, large areas are considered to have fairly low probabilities of becoming urban by 2030. Another data product that we produce is called the US Census Bridge. And what we've done here is we've essentially gridded all the long-form variables. These are the population characteristics in addition to the population itself. But the, the interest here is to describe uh, the types or characteristics of populations in the United States. Here we see that the elderly population, and this is the percent elderly, uh, is particularly high, or there's a high proportion of elderly in much of the Midwest, areas around here, and also some clusters in northern parts of New England and, and out west. Uh, but generally, uh, oh, and of course, down in Miami, but generally the uh, proportions are a bit lower in most of the rest of the United States. We have a large poverty mapping collection, and this is one of the main data sets, which is called the infant mortality rates uh, of the world, or global infant mortality rates. We produce both a gridded and a vector version of this data set. Infant mortality rates happen to be very highly correlated at the lower end of the income spectrum. So you can see uh, large areas of Africa, Afghanistan, and some other uh, places where poverty is particularly severe. In addition, we have a global data set of the prevalence of child malnutrition, which is a measure of the underweight status of children. I use this data set in an analysis for Africa looking at the correlates of malnutrition in some 300 units. So this, this is a much higher resolution than doing things at a national level where you'd only have 40 units. Using the subnational data set, we have 300 units. And what I did is I looked at the relationship between child malnutrition, and on the upper left-hand side, we see a map of runoff, which is a measure of water availability. On the upper right-hand side, we see a measure of the frequency of droughts per uh, unit of analysis. On the bottom left, we see the number of households with pipe water, the control variable, essentially uh, relevant for measuring urbanization. And on the bottom right, you see malaria transmission. My findings showed that of the various biophysical variables, drought frequency was the most significant one. TNAC also has a number of pre-integrated data products. This is an example of one where we took biomes from the World Wildlife Federation's biomes data set by Olson et al., uh, as well as climate zones, coastal proximity, elevation, and a number of other geographic variables. And we summarized those in a tabular format. Uh, so in this case, we're looking at the biomes that are in desert and shrublands, and we're looking at land area and percent population for two points in time, or three points in time, sorry. Uh, so first, if we look at uh, Bahrain and Afghanistan, we see that there are very high rates uh, or high percentages of land area that are in this desert and Zurich shrubland biome, as well as very high percentages of population. If you look at Algeria, by contrast, there's a similarly high percentage of land area, but very small percentages of population that live in those areas. Other pre-integrated data products include the Human Appropriation of Net Primary Productivity, which is developed by Mark Impoff at NASA, which includes, uh, includes as data inputs the GPW version 3, as well as ADHRR data on net primary productivity. Low elevation coastal zone uh, assessment, which looked at populations in urban and rural areas uh, integrated with SRTM, which is a shuttle radar topography mission, visual elevation model data. The sea level impacts on Ramsar wetlands, which Sri will be describing a bit more in his portion of this presentation, which includes an integration of rump, infant mortality rate data, as well as SRTM data and Ramsar site boundaries for Ramsar sites of an international importance. These are wetland sites. 
And lastly, the human footprint version two, which combines GPW with roads, rivers, nighttime lights, and land cover data to assess the degree of human impact on the environment. There are a number of other data sets that have been relatively recently added to the CDAC collection, including the Global Roads Open Access data set. This is a version one product which I'm responsible for and which is the best available currently, best available public domain global data set. So there are a number of qualifiers, but it is a complete view of the road network for the world. Um, we also have a global dams database, which has a collection of dams for all dams that um, uh, have reservoirs associated with them with greater than 0.1 cubic kilometers of water volume. And these dams are coded by different types. I'll note while I'm at it that this is a data product that was developed by a third party, Bernard Lerner and other colleagues at McGill University and part of the uh, Water Systems Analysis Program. And so we do disseminate some third party data sets. Lastly, I'll cover a number of other uh, data products that are frequently used, including the Natural Disaster Hotspots Collection, developed for the World Bank, Anthropogenic Biomes, developed by Earl Ellis at University of Maryland Baltimore campus, Agricultural Land, and Global Fertilizer Use, developed by Navin Ramakudi at McGill University, uh, Species Grids Data, Environmental Treaties, Particulate Matter Grids, Sulfur Dioxide Emissions, and Climate Impacts on Food Supply. The map at right shows this recent product, which is particulate matter grids developed by uh, combining MISER and MODIS data. And we've developed um, aggregations by country, which are population weighted using GPW. So at this point, I think we're going to transition to uh, Sri Vinay. So we're going to mute our phone, our microphone, and do that transition. And Jennifer will introduce Sri. Okay. Thank you, Alex. So as Alex mentioned, we are now going to transition over to the live demonstration portion of the webinar. Allow me to introduce our next speaker, Shri Vinay, who is the system engineer at CDAC. Shri? Thank you, Jennifer, and thank you, Alex. And uh, greetings, everyone who joined in for today's webinar. My name is Shri Vinay, and I am the system engineer for CDAC. Uh, my background actually is in software engineering, and at CDEC, I coordinate the system development and the system operation activities for the project. So today, I am going to demonstrate, actually a live demonstration of our, how to discover our data sets and how to visualize them using our map services. So just to summarize what I will be demonstrating, um, I, I will demonstrate how to search for CDAC data sets that a user might be interested in, how to find the corresponding map services, how to visualize these map services uh, using our mapping tool, and I will also demonstrate a couple of custom mapping tools that we have developed. The first one is actually for visualizing and querying wetlands of international importance. These are Ramsar sites that Alex mentioned uh, in his slide. Uh, and finally, I will actually demonstrate the CDAC population estimation service. So at this point, um, I'm going to actually switch to the live demo. And I'm going to start with showing the CDAC website. So this is our CDAC homepage, and let's say uh, I want to actually browse all the data sets that CDAC has. So I go to the data menu here on the top left, click on the data sets, 
And what I get is all the 176 data sets that CDAC have. You can browse through this, or if I am interested in a particular data set, for example, population density, I can narrow down, filter this data set, narrow down and find the particular data set of interest. I can search using the free text field on the left here, or I can use the facet that we have on the left. These are facets organized by team, the year the data set is published, or the actual temporal coverage of the data set, or the formats in which these data sets are available. So I am interested in population density in raster format for year 2000, let's say. So let me click on the population theme. So now I filter down the data set down to 46. And I'm only interested in the raster data set. Now I filtered it down to 90 data sets. I am only interested in data for year 2000. Now I am down to nine data sets. And let's see, I am interested in population density grid from the GROM project. So I click on this link, and it takes me to the data set overview page, which describes the data set briefly. And it provides links to download, links to view uh, static maps that have that we developed up front. Or you can explore the map services. It provides the metadata. This is formal uh, ISO or SUDC metadata. And if there is any additional documentation available, there will be a documentation tab here on top. And this view is actually standardized across all of our 176 data sets. So once you are familiar with the site, it's very easy to uh, explore the site and find the information you are looking for. Uh, you can also download the citation for this data set uh, from this page. Um, we provide two different formats that support uh, different types of citation software. So if you click on these links, you can download the citation and cite them in your research or in your paper or, or your work. So let's see, uh, I want to take you to exploring our map services. So I'm interested in seeing the map layers available for this uh, data set. So I'll click on the map services tab. And here is some technical details provided on the left here on how to access this map service in other tools. But you can also visualize these map layers using this widget here. Let me click on this widget. Uh, it opens up a map client application. It shows the three layers available for this data set. In this case, it's the 1990, 1995, and the 2000 population density layer. Uh, you can select a different layer and visualize it. So let me close this uh, map viewer. Um, you can also visualize all the CDAC map layers by going through this maps menu here on top and click on the best map tab here. So this map tool presents all of our map layers organized by different themes. CDAC basically works on about 15 themes listed here. So you can uh, choose a theme of your interest. Let me, let me pick conservation here. And you can focus to a region of interest, let's see, Asia. And then say you want to look at the human footprint map layer. So click on that layer on your left panel here. And that layer shows up. What you see here is human, I mean, geographic areas affected by human activity. So those in green are less affected and those in red are more affected by human activity. Uh, Alex earlier described how this data set was derived, so I will not go into those details. Excuse me. Uh, let me 
go back to the left side. And if you go to our map services page through the maps menu, all the map layers are listed, organized by different data collection. You can view all these layers in this page. It also provides technical details about how to uh, integrate these layers into different uh, mapping applications, such as open layers or colors. Um, I will now demonstrate an example of a different mapping tool developed by NASA Earth Data Project using uh, and that project and that mapping tool actually integrates a couple of feed layers, actually more than a couple. They are integrating many feed layers into that mapping tool. So what you see here is uh, uh, actually a three layers. The first layer, actually the one in the dot, uh, showing the dot circles, are the fires uh, obtained from the MODIS sensor from NASA. And this fire layer is actually for November 20, that is today. Okay, so this is current data, it's near real-time data, overlaid with CDAC ground population density for 2,000 layers, which is this, uh, this layer here. The darker brown color is more population, and the brown is actually less population. And also, it overlays the CDAC national boundaries layer on this mashup. So you can see um, there are a few layers, few fires actually, a cluster of fires in Western Africa where the population density is high around this area here. So if you are interested in a, in a hazard or vulnerability use case where you want to estimate or you want to see where these natural hazard activities are and, and whether that area is densely populated or not, you can use a view like this. So at this point, I'm going to summarize what I have demoed so far. So I'm going to switch over to the slides. Excuse me, so I think the slides are still loading. Takes a moment. Okay, here we go. So just to summarize, all CDAC raster and vector data sets are available through web map services, WMS in short, web map child services, WMDS for short. In addition, all the raster data sets are available as web coverage services, WCS. Vector data sets are available as web feature services, WFS. All these services can be consumed or integrated into a variety of client applications, including ArcGIS Desktop, ArcGIS Online, the NASA Worldview application that I demonstrated a minute ago, the NASA Whirlwind application, and open layer test uh, applications and others. Uh, the details on how to integrate these layers into ArcGIS desktop and ArcGIS online is actually available in the frequently asked questions section on the CDAC website. And the service descriptions for all of our services are available on this website. And the CDAC map client to visualize all these layers are available on this link here. So now I'm going to move on to one of the custom mapping tools that we have developed. This tool is actually helps you access the exposure to sea level rise of coastal wetlands, designated as wetlands of international importance by Ramsar Convention. And these sites are in short called Ramsar sites. So at this point, I'm going to switch to the live demo again.
Okay, this is the mapping tool, and it shows all the Ramsar sites around the world. Uh, this, this circle you see are the pen points of those Ramsar sites. Those colored in red are actually at risk of sea level rise. Those colored in blue are at low risk for sea level rise. And those shown in gray actually don't have side boundaries associated with that. So let me move on to this, this Ramsar site here that's at risk. This is in northern Canada. Let me move the map layer to the middle and zoom into that point. And the red polygon that you see around the centroid is actually the Ramsar site boundary that uh, I mentioned earlier. Now, if you click on that point, the centroid point, you get all the basic information about that Ramsar site. The name of the site, the Ramsar site number as assigned by the Ramsar Convention, whether site is at risk or not, since it was colored red originally, that site is at risk, and the total area of this wetland site, which is uh, roughly 22,000 kilometers square. And the area at risk for sea level rise is displayed here at the bottom. So if there is a sea level rise of one meter, uh, roughly 230 kilometers square of the site will be affected, and 320 kilometers square will be affected if there is a sea level rise of two meters. So now let me switch back to the slide and summarize. Oh, this, excuse me. Before I do that, I just want to show this website again. This is the data set overview page for that uh, sea level rise impact on Ramsar site data set. You can learn more about the data set site. You can learn more, more about the map client I demonstrated by clicking there. And let me move back to my site now to summarize this. So the slides are loading. Sorry for the minor delay there. So just to summarize, all the Ramsar site centroids and the site boundaries and the data are available through web mapping service, web map type service, and web feature service. The more information about the data set and the mapping tools are available at this URL. Let me move to the final portion of my demonstration. And in this part, I'm going to talk about the CDAS population estimation service. So we have developed this service and a tool for estimating population total and related statistics within a user-defined area of interest. The service actually uses CDAS gridded population of the world version 3, EPWV3 data set for the year 2005. Let me switch to the live demo at this point. So here is the initial view of the CDAC population estimation tool. Uh, we are showing the uh, Google base layer. This is actually the uh, Terrain, the Google terrain layer. If you uncheck that, you can get a street view of the uh, Google layer. Or you can turn on the satellite layer and you can have a satellite view. Let me switch back to the street view. Let's say I am interested in uh, estimating how many people may have been affected by the Hurricane Sandy, which happened about one year ago. Uh, in the greater New York area. So by clicking on this polygon drawing tool here on the top left, 
you can draw polygons on this map for you, defining your area of interest and find how much population is in that in that area. So let me do that. Let me start here. Go by Philadelphia. Philadelphia and depict to the northwest. Back to around New York here, at Long Island. And let me close the polygon here. So the request of this uh, by the tool is actually sent to the backend population estimation service. So it's going to take a few seconds to return the results. What it's going to return is the estimated population for this area, the number of cells. These are the one kilometer population grid cells from the GRUM data set. Uh, actually, pardon me, it's actually from the GBW data set and the grid cell resolution is actually four kilometers. So it returned how much population in this area. In this case, it turned out to be um, turned out to be 90 million by right here, if you can read this part here. And the total cell count is 1,285, I believe. So that many four kilometer grid cells are in that area. The minimum population of a given cell, grid cell, in that area is zero. The maximum population is 390,000. That's probably in the Manhattan area. The mean population of a grid cell is 9,900. And then it also shows standard deviation and few other statistics. I believe the total land area as well and few other statistics. Uh, you can search for a location of your interest if you wish to in the search box here. Uh, let me show the website that describes more about this population estimation service. So the, the population estimation tool is supported on both desktops and laptops, as well as tablets and smartphones. So if you use your iPad, you should be still able to draw polygons using your, your finger and sliding the map around and so on. The, the web service is actually accessible through OGC Web Processing Service Protocol, the OGC WPS. It's also available through the RCIS REST protocol and the RCIS SOAP protocol, which stands for Single Object Access Protocol. Uh, the CDAC website and the frequently asked questions provide more details on how to access these services and integrate into your application. And these two URLs provide you more information about your services and the tools. So that concludes my presentation and the live demo. Thank you very much for listening in. And I will now hand over to Jennifer for the next part of the presentation. Thank okay. you so much. Okay. Thank you, Shri. Uh, thank you, everybody. We will now move to the polling questions. And as these pull up here, uh, remember there's no submit button there is a multiple answer for the multiple answer and the multiple choice. Once you've selected, your, vo your vote has been registered. Only the short answer questions have a submit button, and it's located directly to the right of the text box that is used to type in your answer. All right, so we'll give this about you know three to five minutes. Um, if you want to take a short break before the Q&A, please be sure to stay on the line or stay in the meeting room. The question and answer period will follow directly after the uh, polling question. Thank you.
Okay, we'll give it just another minute or so. There's not too much um, activity here. So we'll give it another minute or two here, okay? Then we'll move to the question and answer period. Okay, everybody, we are going to move to the question and answer period. Um, if you have any, you know, concerns or any other topics you'd like to hear about, please feel free to email uh, me, Jennifer Brennan, um, with any ideas, or you can certainly type those into the Q&A pod as well. Okay, so let's see if we've got any questions here yet. Not seeing any questions yet. If you have a question, type it into your Q&A pod. Okay. Any questions? Okay, most of the, okay, here we go. The first question, is it possible to use CDAC developed algorithms to extract data from FAO and apply to sub-country census tract boundaries? Shri or Alex? Shri or Alex, are you on the line here? Yeah, what we were just facing a little bit of technical difficulty because my my connection just disconnected from I couldn't hear the question. Could you repeat it? Uh, of course. So the question is coming from uh, Kate. Is it possible to use CDAC developed algorithms to extract data from FAO and apply to subcountry census tract boundaries? Someone's trying to help me see the whole thing. Okay, so um, okay, so we have this um, proportional all allocation algorithm, which I think is what she's referring to, and um, it's it's certainly something we could share with people. It's a Python script. Uh, so if people want to contact us offline. I think you're going to put up a slide, Jennifer, with contact information. I do. I will. In fact, when we're finished with the question and answer, I do have a contact information slide. Um, and again, if you, this webinar will be posted. So if you missed that, you can always feel free to check out the recording online at this URL you see here. Also, always feel free to email me, and I will forward that email along to uh, CDAC user services. Okay, so we will we will show that in just a bit. So it sounds as though you'll be able to share that uh, code. Yes, we would be. Okay, the next question is, is there any information where your data sets have been used before? Well, I, I don't understand the question, so maybe we should move on to the next one. What, what I can say is that for every data set we have, 
there is a citation uh, column. So at, at a, the collection level, we have on the left-hand side of the standard data set page a citations to, um, menu item. And we regularly populate that with updated citations of the data set. So hopefully that answers the question. Earlier I had seen some other questions that were listed in another pod that I disappeared somehow, so I don't know where it went. But All that, of the Q&A remain in the same Q&A. They're, they're okay. not anywhere else. They're, they're only in here. The, um, the question I saw was related to ways in which these data have been used for climate vulnerability assessment. And in fact, that's an area of active research interest for myself. So anyone who wants to contact me can either search the web and get my email address or contact uh, the season help desk and they'll forward the emails to me. I'll be happy to provide references to ways in which these data have been used in, in climate vulnerability and impact assessments. Okay, so um, Jana or Jana, does that answer your question regarding the citations? I don't know whether or not you might have been looking for a citation database um, illustrating some of the usage of the CDAC data holdings. You could just type in here. The next question is, could you explain how to use WMS into GIS applications? Could you explain how to use WMS into GIS applications? Um, yeah, this is free, actually. Um, so if you are using, let's say, the ArcGIS desktop, uh, using Arc Catalog or the Arc Map uh, tool, uh, you can bring our services into the into the tool. Uh, on our website, more details are given. We can uh, we can provide the URL for that website. So using those instructions, you can bring our service into your uh, desktop application or EIS application, and uh, all the layers from the service can be visualized that way. Does that answer? Okay, the next question is actually, would like to be able to view the webinar again, is that possible? And yes, that will be possible. So within a few days, um, you know, after this recording has ended, um, I will be posting it at the tinyurl.com Earth Data Webinar site. I will also send a direct link to the recording to all registrants, including those who were unable to attend today. Um, so when you receive that link, you'll be able to click and pull up uh, the web, the recording, as well as you'll have the opportunity to download any of those files you see in the lower right-hand corner. That will be something that is persistent even, you know, after posting. So you'll be able to download files and, again, any questions, contact us. The next question here is, oh, it's a continuation. It is, uh, or based on the, the initial um, question regarding the FAO and apply to subcountry census tract boundaries. Kate has elaborated. Or are there ways to build on CDAC's methods for creating spatial data from global census data? Yeah, absolutely. We can go ahead and uh, send some of the Python scripts or other methods that we've developed. and. Those are also documented, and I have some publications that describe them, so we'd be very happy to send those on. Okay. Uh, the next question is, I have tried to explore the PM 2.5 data. Is this data available on country level? So the answer to that question is yes. Right now, we have the gridded data set available through the URL that is, uh, was described earlier. Uh, if you search PM 2.5 in the upper right-hand corner of the CDAC website, you'll find it. In the EPI 2012 data set, which is the Environmental Performance Index for 2012, also searchable on the CDAC website, you will find that there are country level aggregates of average PM 2.5 concentrations 
in time series. We are currently updating those data using improved data from colleagues at Dalhousie University, and those data will be available through the 2014 Environmental Performance Index. Okay. I don't see any further questions. Oh, here's, a, here's another question here. What is the big picture plan for developing future data sets? Can users or the public provide suggestions or make requests? Uh, absolutely. We would be very, very uh, happy to receive suggestions from uh, users in terms of what kind of new data we are planning to develop. We currently have just actually, as of today, submitted our annual work plan for this fiscal year, which actually began in October, but uh, we traditionally submit that in November. And we've got a number of data sets in line, which we'll be working on. Uh, we have a global grid of gross domestic product. We'll be working on an update to the uh, global roads open access data set. We will be uh, developing a number of other data sets. Um, wish I had my list in front of me, but I don't. But uh, we would be very delighted to receive suggestions from users in terms of data that would be useful for their purposes. Bear in mind, however, that there are often needs for data in very specific locations. Our goal is to produce global scale data sets that are useful across a range of uh, world regions, and so we typically do not invest a lot of time and effort in developing data sets that would be useful for one country or one, uh, one small subregion of the world. Okay, thank you, Alex. The next question is two part, again by uh, Kate. Can Grump data, part one, can Grump data be used to look at changes in rural versus urban population over time for a given cell? And part two, what areas of the world have you found your population data to be most or least accurate for? So again, part one is, can Grump data be used to look at changes in rural versus urban population over time for a given cell? Well, that's a really good question, and uh, so it's a bit of a complicated answer. Uh, the first part of that question is, can you look at changes in rural versus urban population? Uh, yes, but with some caveats. What we are currently releasing is actually a time series grid based on Grump, which is using the high, which is history of the world, History Database of the World, which is a database coming out of DBL in the Netherlands. That is a historical time series of population, but at a much coarser resolution. So we use HIVE to backcast ground populations in 1970, and we have decadal time slices up to 2100. I'm sorry, 2010. Correction. So um, we are often a bit cautious about narrowing in on one particular grid cell or set of grid cells to look at what's happening in those particular locations. But for regional type analyses where you're, say, taking a, a larger region, we, we feel there's, um, the results are fairly robust. Um, we have difficulty in collecting high-resolution census data for a number of regions, including Africa, although that's improving with time. Um, large parts of uh, less populated regions of Asia. Um, what you can do is if you go to the GPW website, you just go to our homepage, type in GPW in the upper right-hand corner search box, you'll find the GPW page. You'll actually find the number of census inputs for every single country. And that will give you an idea, and it will tell you the exact uh, area in kilometer square or average area for the census units that are used to produce that data set. 
we wish the data were at the highest resolution everywhere, but the reality is that there are many countries that currently um, still restrict access to the highest resolution census data. An example is India, which is, of course, a demographic giant, but we cannot access the TESOL level data from the Census Bureau there, and that's the highest resolution data. Uh, there's no good reason for it, but that's just is the reality. Okay, well, thank you, Alex. We have a couple of more questions here. Um, one is more so uh, a comment. Uh, lots of good information presented. We'll need to further digest and explore how we might use this in our work. We will have a particular interest in the climate and agriculture data set. So the next question is, has there been a comparison between Grump, GPW, and other similar products such as Afropop or Asia Pop? That's another really good question. It happens to be by a colleague of ours, Gary. So hi, Gary. Um, yes, uh, we have not done systematic like cell-by-cell -cell evaluations between uh, GPW Grump and these other products. Um, we do know that for certain applications, it's valuable to use Acropop, Asiapop, or even LandScan. Um, however, the methods that they use are very different. They tend on the whole. So Acropop and Asiapop both use GPW as an input. So there's a sense in which they're building on what we've done, but they're taking it another step by using uh, I think Landsat scale, but maybe even higher resolution satellite data to model and to put people into grid cells based on uh, built up areas. So yes, of course, it's going to be higher resolution, but there are a few more assumptions that go into that. So we believe there's a, um, definitely a role for simple population models which simply grid what is available at the highest resolution possible. If people want to take that another step further and reallocate the data according to census imagery and their own interpretation of what those imagery mean, we think that's also valuable. But those are often only useful for different types of use cases. So you wouldn't necessarily want to use those kinds of data for um, uh, land cover and population analyses because you'd be that would be in a sense endogenous um, population model would be endogenous to the land cover data. I don't know if I'm making myself clear. Okay, and there is a another question here by Patrick. There are an increasing number of global online data sets or apps slash apps available. What if any, plans does NASA have to connect such related data sets, apps? Well, I can start and maybe Sri can complete my answer, but um, you know, we're always evaluating the landscape of what's available online, uh, what new data sets are available. Uh, we try hard not to replicate what other people are doing, but rather provide value added. And um, you know, we're aware, for instance, in the realm of the global roads data set, we work very closely with OpenStreetMap, which is producing a crowdsourced data set on streets uh, and roads globally. It's an excellent data set. Nico Myron is part of our advisory group on this other global roads data set we're developing. But he himself said they're not yet at the point where they've got complete coverage in all regions of the world. So we try to evaluate what else is out there and fill those gaps as best as possible. As far as apps goes, maybe Sri can say a word or two about that. Hi, yeah, this is Sri. So in terms of integrating apps or services from other data sources, we are always uh, exploring opportunities for them for that. For example, we will be developing tools in the future that uh, integrate maybe remote sensing data from, for example, other NASA data centers as well as uh, other agencies globally. If the services are available in a format that we can integrate readily, usually using standardized web services. So yes, we do have future plans for them, but uh, what kind of service and what kind of app is hard to tell at this point. I think we will be focusing more on, uh, on use cases that are around 
hazards and vulnerability analysis. But if there are other topics that uh, of interest, we could consider that too. Okay. So I don't see any further questions. Um, however, the thought occurred to me that we could take a look at the future topics to determine whether or not there are any questions embedded in there within the polling. I'm going to go ahead and take the participants off mute, and so long as there is not any feedback, um, you know, feel free to uh, ask any questions. The conference is now in talk mode. Okay, so right now it sounds okay. Uh, for those who wish to stay on the line, we'll go ahead and take a look at some of the um, answers here to the future topics. Okay, to determine uh, one of the future topics was examples of, uh, ex of application of the data for environmental sustainability and climate change. Uh, application, it look, sounds like more um, citations. Is it possible, okay, that's the same, we already answered that. Would like to see specific presentations on subtopics, further exploration of data available for climate change. I don't know if either one of you wanted to speak to that. Uh, descriptions, how these data sets were created and their accuracy. We have been working with them and there are some inconsistencies worth addressing. Anybody, any? Uh, Either one of you care to comment on that? If the person who posed the, the question actually wants to say something more about that, that might be valuable. Mm -hmm. Okay. That might be a question to send directly to, um, just looking to see whether or not they're, the webinar will be available for review. Um, okay, so I think that's it. Let me go ahead and pull up the comment. slide. I thank everybody for joining us today. A good portion of at least half of the participants um, logged off at three, probably due to other time commitments. So thank you everybody for joining us. We appreciate it. Likewise, we enjoyed it. Okay. Bye-bye. We're going to go ahead and conclude this webinar at this time. Thank you everybody. The conference is now in silent mode.